referred to as the king of all butterflies, the monarch has a fascinating life cycle. This creature is known for its incredible mass migration, but scientists are concerned about its population. Coming up on this episode of The Paw Report, we're joined by Douglas Hart Nature Center Education Director, Jennifer Tarek, who's been tracking this iconic pollinator. So stay with us. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paw Report. I am your host, Kelly Runyon, and we kind of go from always talking about our four-legged friends to some winged friends on this episode of The Paw Report, and we're joined by Jennifer Tarek. She is the Education Director over at Douglas Hart Nature Center. Wonderful people over there. We love to have you folks on The Paw Report. You're always so informative, and today we have another great topic to talk about, and that is Monarch butterfly, something very close to your heart. Jennifer, what started your fascination with the monarch? I think it was just butterflies in general. I grew up in the country on the farm and just always saw butterflies. They were one of the first insects that just fascinated me. And I think that goes for a lot of people when they're thinking about insects. Some people are like, no, 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 I don't do insects. And some are like, yeah, some insects are okay. Some are, you know, not crazy about them. But when you ask them about insects, they probably all love butterflies. And so it's a great just kind of starter for people. And the same as me as a kid. Um, some insects I wasn't too sure of as a kid and was so excited when the butterflies would come around. So really just loved going out and catching them and just kind of being that carefree kid, just seeing what butterflies I could catch from day to day. Heck, they're pretty too. That's, that's the Absolutely. other thing. And they don't bite and leave a mark. So that's also a Absolutely. plus. Absolutely. How many different you know, when we think of butterflies, is there a lot of different species and, and specifically the monarch? Is it just the monarch or, or are there other species of that particular butterfly? Yeah, for the monarch, it is it is its own species. So, um, but in Illinois, we have several other different kinds of butterflies, as you can see some different varieties here. Um, but just for the monarch, he is, he is he's it. it, he's it. Now he has some that kind of look like him and they try to mimic him a little bit, but he's it. Well, we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about monarchs, but I, you know, since you talked about some other species, you got your butterfly net out before mm -hmm. this, uh, this show today and you caught some different species. What'd you bring today? I did. So yeah, I used my net and just to give you an idea, I went out for just about an hour and this is all the different varieties I caught at our property, um, at the nature center. Oh, yeah. And, and just, yes. in just an hour. Okay. And what'd you bring? So we have, um, I should definitely point him out first. This is the Viceroy, and he is very much like the Monarch, um, but there's just one key tail. He has a stripe down his back hind wings there, and as you can see on my pretend little Monarch right there, there's no stripe going down the bottom, and plus the size, he's about double, Monarchs are about double the size, so these mm -hmm. two, you can definitely confuse the two um, if you're not aware of those key characteristics, but we also brought a Swallowtail, this guy he's is a big. He's a big one. They're big. They're gorgeous. And we have a couple different swallowtail species here in Illinois. Um, this is a black swallowtail. It has a very pretty blue on its hind wing as well. Mm -hmm. Now, once you master, like, viewing the top side of the butterflies, well, when they close their wings, they're a whole different color and pattern. So it takes a lot of practice. And even I don't know all the species. Sometimes I have to look them up as well. Um, but we have some skippers. We have tons and tons of skipper butterflies here. And so he was one I had to look up because, like I said, there's so many. And the smallest little color pattern changes the species of butterfly. 
And sk skippers are actually the fastest flyers out of all the butterflies. Mm. So they're hard to catch. So I'm really happy that we were able to get one of these guys. Here's another common one we have. This is a red admiral. And if you opened it up on his bottom side, you see no orange and black whatsoever. So again, oh. He's decided to He's gonna show, show off, off. yes, there we go. He's gonna show off. He knew I was talking about his wings there. So yeah, see completely different patterns on the underside. So once you, you know, practice IDing them, you not only gotta learn the top pattern, but the bottom pattern as well. Mm -hmm. But he's another really common guy we have around here. Um, then we brought some of the clouded sulfurs right here. And then we have a cabbage white. This is probably the most common butterfly in Illinois, the cabbage white. Um, they feed on, well, clover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got a lot of clover here in farmland. <laughs> so yeah, so these are, I mean, in an hour, I caught just a nice variety of butterflies found right here in Coles County. Jennifer, if we could go back to the monarch, mm -hmm. um, what is it, exactly the metamorphosis of the of the monarch? I mean, uh, you know, we start with a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. I'll let you continue. Yeah, so all butterflies do a complete metamorphosis. And for monarchs, they, it's a, it ties into the migration, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit later, but it starts with after they hatch out of that chrysalis is their caterpillar. Um, and they're very, very, very tiny. And all they do is eat, right? Eat, 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 eat. And they, they molt. And they, each time they molt, they grow a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Um, finally, till they're just so plump, they know it's time for them to come a butterfly. So they crawl up to the perfect spot and they hang themselves in a J. So they'll be hanging there in a perfect little J, hanging upside down. And then soon enough, you'll see the chrysalis. And they have monarchs in my opinion have the most beautiful chrysalis they have a green with gold little spots and lines on them is it a cocoon and in fact i have yes. this great yes um so yeah the chrysalis is like a cocoon and usually people uh for moths we call them cocoons and for butterflies we call them chrysalis um, but they have this beautiful green chrysalis with the gold dots on them and after a few weeks, well, something just magical happens in there. And as hard as I try to study and understand what happens in this stage, is to me, it's still just magic. Um, mm. What happens is that caterpillar, it releases enzymes and it breaks down the caterpillar's body. So it's kind of like caterpillar soup going on in there. Oh um, boy. I, yes. <laughs> and then those body parts um, will develop uh, in that butterfly. And Interesting. Yeah. Is it more like a, like a cocoon? Yeah. 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 So he's sealed in there pretty tight. And you know, if you watch it, it'll start wiggling a little bit and you know the time has come. He's about to hatch. So look for it to move a little bit. And then it starts to, you start to see the black just a little bit and you know he's about to emerge out. And once he does, he'll be there for several hours because he has to dry off and he's pumping blood through his body to dry off and get ready to fly away. How long is the process from start to finish of that yeah, metamorphosis? It, it's, um, it usually depends, but two to four weeks. So he'll be in there kind of cooking, if you will. <laughs> Excellent. Now, what are some of the interesting, I can set this down for you. Sure. What are some of the interesting facts about a monarch that maybe, maybe just, you know, you and me wouldn't know? Some of the interesting signs. So with monarchs, they, as caterpillars, they feed on milkweed, which is actually a poisonous plant. Um, and so that poison actually stays with the butterfly. So once he's gone through his whole process and he's an adult, he is a venomous butterfly. And so birds know, I'm not gonna eat that butterfly. He's not of interest to me, he's poisonous. And so some say, well, the viceroy mimics him perfectly, so, so birds won't eat him as well. So they are a very yucky tasting butterfly because of the venom from the milkweed that they eat. Um, other butterflies, including the monarch, they actually taste with their feet which is an interesting fact. So they can taste and sense food with their antenna, uh, but once they land on a flower or a puddle or some sort, they're, they're actually using their the sensors on their, on their feet to, to taste and see if it's any good, if there's good minerals or nutrients in it, so. What about um, 
dots have a significant meaning to monarchs. Those dots are so important. <laughs> yes. So we, well, that life cycle has got to continue um, with the mating season. And the two little dots um, represent a male monarch. Um, and in fact, I can show you on this one if you want. I'll have you hold it up to... Uh, there you go. Yeah, so here are two little spots on him, and those are his, that's his cologne, or his pheromones, I like to say, and those are going to release that scent into the air so he can attract a mate and attract the females. So you know if you go out and catch a butterfly, if you see one with those two little spots on a monarch, you know you've got a male. What about, uh, do they have lungs? They do not have lungs. Um, they actually pull in air. There's, as with a lot of insects, they have little holes down the side of their body called spiracles, and they push air in and out through there. And what about um, their wingspan? Yeah. You were, you were mentioning, you know, the, the example of the other species of butterfly you you brought is a lot smaller, but what is the typical wingspan? So he's usually about three to four inches, sometimes a little, you know, a little give or take whatnot, but that's a, a, again a key way that the viceroy, he's, he's twice, twice as small as, as the monarch. So the most monarchs are around the four inches. And if you look at the swallowtail, they're much larger as well. So their size is usually straight on. Monarchs and um, swallowtails are one of the biggest we have in Illinois. I'm going to give you this vase of flowers back yes. because we're going to talk about the feeding process. Ah, yes. You brought the milkweed, which we're going to, I'd like for you to show. Mm -hmm. um, but how do they locate flowers? And then once they get to the flowers or the milkweed, what happens next? So the key thing with butterflies as adults is they're looking for great flowering plants with nectar. Nectar is the key thing, as well as something hummingbirds and bees. They're also looking for great nectaring flowers. Um, and so they can sense the smells and the nectar through their antenna, as well as those feet receptors I talked about. And even some species of butterfly can sense ultraviolet light and hmm. so some flowers give off ultraviolet light and they're attracted to that light and so once and some see in certain colors so some butterflies can see the colors of flowers only some see in certain colors so you can't always rely that they can see the same colors as we do um, so once they're finding a good nectaring plant they're going to land on it give it a little taste with their feet again and then they have this long proboscis tongue that comes out. Think think a straw that uncoils and they mm. will just sip up that nectar because they need a lot of energy. They burn a lot of energy as they fly around. And these are just wildflowers that I'm assuming were planted around the Douglas Hart Nature Center that you picked to bring in today. In case people were wondering, we're going to talk about setting up a garden, mm -hmm. but wildflowers are easy and something you can set up. Milkweed. Mm -hmm. And what is the other um, green that you brought along today. Yeah, so not only um, the flowering plants, but I did bring in a few of the grasses because, well, Illinois is the prairie state, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have that much prairie left, unfortunately. So even setting up small pocket gardens um, are really key to helping the pollinators, bees, butterflies, birds. But even the grasses, there are some, um, a lot of skipper butterflies. They um, overwinter inside some of the prairie grasses. So without these grasses, they have no way to survive the winter. So their, their chrysalis, so to speak, is inside some of these grasses. So not only the flowers and, and the caterpillar plants, there's even the grasses to, to think about when setting up certain gardens to help them. And especially with the monarch, we need lots of milkweed around. Um, some people see, you know, common milkweed and they think it's just a weed and it has these little pods and people mm -hmm. think, that, well, that's not very nice. But um, milkweed is essential for the monarch because it is the only plant that the caterpillars feed on. So as the butterflies um, are mating and they're going to find milkweed and they're going to lay their eggs on the milkweed plant and only on milkweed. And you usually, if you lift up the bottom of the leaf, you'll find these little white pearly eggs and those are the, the monarch eggs. So after a short while, they'll hatch out and like I said, they eat, eat, eat. The caterpillars only eat milkweed. So without milkweed, our, our species are declining. So we really want to, and uh, homeowners to put milkweed out and plant milkweed in their gardens. Hmm. 
y you know, you talked about what an epic journey these monarchs make. And, and prior to doing research before our interview today, I, I didn't realize that, that um, it's, it's the most epic to all species kind, I guess, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, how do we, you know, you've spent a lot of time researching this. How do they determine what direction to go? Where do they go? How long do they go? I'll be honest, it's a mystery. I, I wish I had those answers. And even the top research, um, Monarch Watch, we're partners with them. Um, they conduct research all the time to find out these mysteries, but they have done uh, certain studies, if you will. They've, they've taken monarchs from Kansas and they flew them to Washington, D.C. and they released some of them. Well, they actually flew straight south. So if they were in Kansas to Mexico is where they migrate, it's a straight shot south. Now the other ones, they let rest in Washington for about 48 hours and they actually flew the right direction. They didn't fly straight south. They actually came over the right direction to get to Mexico. So they were trying to determine, well, did they watch the sunrise and sunset and figure out their latitude and longitude? Did they get that just internal clock, you know, coordinated to where they were? It's just one of those great mysteries, but they figured it out. Even when they took them out of their natural habitat, they figured out how to get to Mexico. But the butterflies that actually make the trip in the fall, they've never been to Mexico. How they know how to get to Mexico is just one of those great mysteries. They, um, they, uh, the generations before are the ones that have made that trip. So when they get to Mexico, it is actually one specific forest and even sometimes specific trees year after year after year that these monarchs migrate to. So it's just amazing how they figure out how to do this. So they, as you said, they may go, and it's only one trip because their lifespan is relatively short, but they may go to the same exact tree that the cycle before them mm -hmm. uh, traveled to. Is yes. that correct? Yes, yeah. So in your research, and, and why don't you talk about, you actually mark monarchs. What have you discovered? So we have, with Monarch Watch, we are able to receive these tags, and it's like a think license plate for a butterfly. And we put these little stickers on the underside of their wings, which doesn't hurt them or impede their flying in any way. Um, and with that, we've been able to study um, how weather patterns have affected them. So they, we can watch storms come through and see these butterflies get thrown off course. Um, or, you know, this last winter was very mild. And so we were tracking the butterflies to see, are they emerging early? Are they leaving early? And that's a risk that they're taking if there's a mild winter because maybe the milkweed in those plants as they make the journey back north, aren't ready yet. So there, there's just so many factors into this migration that they're putting a lot of work and research into. You know, you mentioned um, they're very easy to spot, the butterflies, because they're beautiful, majestic even as an insect, but there are fewer and fewer of them. Um, when you compare how many monarchs there were in the 90s to where they are today, not as many. Do you attribute that all to pesticides and other, you know, chemicals killing off the milkweed? There are honestly several different reasons. Um, you're always going to lose some butterflies. They're, they're no match for cars on the roads or birds and, and natural predators. Um, but there are a lot of factors when humans come to play and, and what our actions are doing to animals, um, specifically the monarchs. Um, so yes, pesticides is a huge one. Um, we definitely, you know, are, are against using pesticides because um, it's killing off the larva or the adult and not just butterflies but a lot of other insects as well. Um, but the key thing is habitat loss. Um, so you know as humans we've been developing so much you know new stores, new parking lots, new this um, that we're taking away those natural areas uh, for butterflies and other wildlife as well. Um, and again we're the prairie state, not much prairie left and again a lot of these Butterflies rely on these flowers, their caterpillars specifically. So the, they only feed on specific plants like the monarch. They only want milkweed, 
So without our prairie anymore, they don't have enough milkweed to kind of sustain the numbers that's, that they once did, so. How can we create a habitat in our own homes? Yes, we. it is really easy to do. Um, these are just varieties of, I have these in my butterfly garden on the side of my house as well. So if you, Honestly, I think they're a lot easier than buying some uh, tropical plants because these are native to Illinois. So they're used to our super hot summers. Mm -hmm. they're, they can find water. Their, their root system actually goes down just as tall as the plants are. So their roots are going down sometimes three, four, five, six feet they can find water. So when it's really hot and, and dry out, they're gonna find water without us watering them all the time. Um, they're kind of resistant against certain pests. So again, since they're native, they're, they, they're, they're used to having different insects around them that might not be the pest insects. Mm -hmm. um, our birds, our bees, our butterflies are attracted to these because these are the plants that were here before us. So they're very used to these. So there's a lot of good benefits to these butter, you know, to these butterfly um, flowers, and there's a lot of good local resources just right here in the community that you can obtain these flowers from. And milkweed too. And I'd have a feeling too. people might be kind of skittish about putting a weed in their yard when they try so hard to get weeds out. Yes. So is is milkweed something that you have at, at the nature center that somebody could maybe come and and get some? We do. During um, the fall, we actually go out and collect seeds of a variety of prairie plants um, and we um, prepare them in our greenhouse. And so we have a greenhouse full of, of these plants. And usually around uh, April for our Earth Day Festival, we have a plant sale where folks can pick up some of these plants and we always have milkweed available. Excellent. You brought along your net. Uh, you know, we've talked about the growth, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the migration of butterflies, but sometimes people want to catch them and enjoy them. So how easy is it to do? And you uh, brought it along your net. I did. I did. Well, you know, especially when I'm tagging monarchs, it takes a lot of practice to capture a butterfly. Um, and even with our programs, we teach kids, get out there, catch some bugs. Let's look at them up close because that's the best way to learn is hands-on learning as well. Um, but it does take a little practice. So I have definitely learned a couple tips along the way. And this specific kind of net is one I would definitely recommend. Um, notice it's kind of the mesh and the see-through. Mm -hmm. So kind of our, our strategy is we, we wait for it to land as, as funny as it would be to see us running through the prairie <laughs> trying to Some capture them. Probably do. Yeah, it's a, you know, it makes for a comic uh, viewing, but you know, it just takes patience. Wait for them to land on a flower and it's really easy just to get that net right over those flowers. And then you're able to just grab him and slide him up this net without harming him in any way. And then you're able to see him in there and transfer him to maybe one of these bug boxes to look at. Great for kids as well um, to have these. But this is our strategy when we tag monarchs as well. So we got to get them in the net and then put that little sticker on his wing. So it does take a little bit practice. But we actually have a crew of, um, I have about 15 volunteers who help in the tagging process with monarchs as well, so. And you probably host programs throughout the year in case anybody's interested in getting some more information or maybe learning a little bit more, maybe uh, addressing some topics that we just didn't have time to today at the Douglas Hart Nature Center. Absolutely, we will be hosting our tagging program um, in the fall, every fall actually. We've had um, butterfly gardens training workshops, so people actually get to lay out the different plants and plan their garden and ask our land stewardship director or myself different questions about different flowers, what would work best for their gardens. So there's probably a variety of programs that would work for their interests, whether it's the butterflies or the prairie plants we've shown today. Excellent. Jennifer, thank you so much for, well, for getting a workout and getting all the butterflies to bring in uh, to the studio today and also for sharing your knowledge and love of the monarch butterfly. We appreciate you joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us for this episode of The Paw Report. We'll see you next time. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too.
In this Paul Report Extra, there's a push to preserve the threatened eastern indigo snake in Florida. A dozen young reptiles have been released into the Apalachicola bluffs and ravines. Naturalists say they'll keep a close eye on the snakes over the next decade. They'll also continue to focus on the establishment of healthy ecosystems through land, water, and wildlife conservation efforts. The indigo snake basically maintains the balance of the population in this type of community. So incredibly important, and it was important that we restored the site and had the right conditions on site before we reintroduced them to give them the best chance of survival so they can repopulate the area. Eastern indigo snakes are the longest native snakes found in the U.S. Oka Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Oka Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sales Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okavetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston.